Hi, everyone. This is Leroy Harbach from CMC Rescue. Um, in this podcast, sat down and had a conversation with John McKintley, uh, kind of looking back over his 47 years of rescue experience and some of the changes that he's seen to equipment and standards. Um, it's a little bit of a free-ranging conversation, but uh, thank you for listening and uh, hope you have a great day. So uh, what are we talking about here? Uh, I remember when or? Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a little bit more about uh, I remember when and, um, you know, a little bit of history and that kind of stuff. And um, so I guess I, I've got a few notes jotted down. Um, so for the sake of uh, edification and for uh, the sake of our multitude of listeners, um, tell us who you are and give us a little bit of your background. So I'm John McKentley. I'm uh, formerly the rescue school director for CMC and uh, almost 47 years in uh, rescue experience, primarily wildland um, in Southern California, Los Angeles County Sheriff, uh, Reserve Deputy, Volunteer Search and Rescue Guy, and uh, otherwise involved in some other things, obviously, with CMC, confined space and other uh, other types of rescue other than just wildland rope, but that's where I started was from from that orientation. Um, so forty seven years. Take a look back. Um, we I did mean, use this... nylon rope. We didn't start with <laughs> Manila rope. <laughs> well, I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna go quite there, and I wasn't gonna, you know, make the accusations that you know I was making last night about you guys having to climb trees and cut down vines. Um, but, um, so what, I guess, what do you see as the biggest changes? Um, I mean, cause you're back from the gold line days, right? Absolutely. Started with three strand laid gold line. And that's obviously a change because we went from, um, laid rope to Kern mantle rope. Climbers were using Kern mantle rope, um, to some extent then. And, um, it's kind of interesting when I when I came on the team um, in '74, guys were saying, "No, we want we were using um, laid rope because uh, the description was if you took the Kern mantle rope and you put it over the sharp corner of a table and hit it with a two by four, you'd cut the internal strands and you'd never see it from the outside and you were going to die." And having done so many, many, many <laughs> rope tests since that time, I find it very amusing that that's what they were they were telling us. But obviously, uh, a few years later, we switched to Kern Mantle Rope, um, really as it, it it came in from uh, in, into the rescue business as opposed to just climbing. Um, but that's one of the big changes is um, mm -hmm. the things that we've seen. We, we went from 11 millimeter. Or, of course, in those days, we didn't have it in millimeters. It came in 7 sixteenths. It was gold line. And then sometimes we had the green military version or green line. Mm -hmm. Same same thing, different die, and um, and then you know we went to half inch Kern mantle. Um, NFPA obviously started in with with ratings and and G ratings and two person ratings and all that. But because we interface so closely with fire agencies, that they were using that material, so we we kind of we went all to half inch, mm -hmm. and then um, later on we started calling twelve point five millimeter, and then. Um, we we went to kind of a two rope system where if we were in the back country, we would go to 11 millimeter uh, Kern mantle rope and we'd stick with the 12 and a half when we were on the side of the road where we didn't have to carry it. And uh, now it's circled around again where everybody, at least here in LA County, has gone going back to the 11 millimeter with the the introduction of the G11 rope. Mm -hmm. So the size of the rope and the cha the the material changed somewhat, but you know nylon polyester, but um, this, the size definitely changed and the construction changed in that period of time where you know, we kind of, in a, in a little bit of a way, went full circle, at least for the size. Yeah, yeah. So hardware-wise, um, I'm going to presume 74, I think I was in middle school, if I remember correctly. <laughs> um, You're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but I did, but I, but I do have a question. Um, so in 74 locking carabiners, 
Did the, the carabiners have locks, or were you guys doing the opposite and opposed steel? Yeah, we ovals, that kind we of had. I was when we issue equipment um, to individuals as well as what we have is team equipment. And there was very little steel. Um, even in those days, we had some locking steel carabiners that we would primarily use on um, go, going around litter rails and, um, you know, connection because we do mm -hmm. use some cable systems uh, connecting the cables to the litters. We use some locking steel carabiners. But we were issued aluminum carabiners, and I was issued um, four ovals and two locking um, offset D carabiners, and mm, um, yeah. and and two bars to go in those oval carabiners for repelling. Um, you know, and, yeah, the you know we didn't we didn't really think about it then, but you know how <laughs> dangerous that was side loading a carabiner gate with a bar and everything like that. But you had a you know, those four oval carabiners and you put bars in two of them and you connected them to you and to the, to each other with the other two carabiners. And, um, and, and that was your repel system. And, um, you know, no, nothing bad happened to anybody with that, but obviously really quickly out of that, um, one of the guys from another team here in, in, in Los Angeles County had, had gotten a clog win, um, figure eight. And, um, we saw that and it was like quite the thing and um, Im immediately switched over to figure eights. They didn't have ears or anything like that, but mm -hmm. um, you couldn't take it off of you. You didn't have that side loading the gate issue. And uh, you know, we went to those and of course the figure eights have evolved since then, but we, we always used aluminum, but that was uh, probably from the climber background as opposed to uh, you know, urban rescue type of thing where there's still so many people using steel. Yeah, in fact, um, Wayne and I were talking earlier today, and um, we were into the little bit of the aluminum versus steel discussion before we went started going down the rabbit holes, which is mm -hmm. the the never ending loop, as we all know. Um, so I do have a question for you. I understand. I mean, I know not only understand, but um, so what did you do before? You uh, became the school director at CMC <laughs> in your I, previous I, life, as we know. I was uh, my my most recent title before I went to CMC was a senior vice president in charge of facilities for a banking institution here in Southern California. Um, bef before that, industry changed so radically. Uh, basically, I I built and remodeled buildings and branch office buildings and in commercial space, you know. So, yeah, hence the uh, indispensability up at uh, the uh, facility in Goleta with the never-ending list of, hey, John, can you come here and fix this? Yeah, so I have, yeah, I have a side job in that uh, <laughs> construction and maintenance world, if you will. And I still have a contractor's license, so. Well, which I, which I would have anticipated. <laughs> Yeah, in case um, I need a side job, right? Yeah, just just in case you need something else to do. Um, so how how did you get into rescue to begin with, and then how did you get hooked up with Montrose? Um, I grew I I live very close to where I grew up, like a block, and uh, was always in this area. I was very active in the Boy Scouts, and one time um, we had a guy from the search and rescue team come and do a uh, what we call a PR talk on the rescue team and he did a spiel about the rescue team uh, to my Boy Scout troop and I thought okay that's always that's pretty cool and everything like that and you know when you're 13 you never really think about what you're going to do much past your that point in your life but um, I went away to school came back again and actually um, lived in the same area where I grew up and uh, the rescue team put an ad in a newspaper and said, hey, we're looking for new members. And I went to a recruitment meeting and with way over 100 people, 120, 130 people, that was um, whittled down to about 12. And uh, seven of us managed to pass the sheriff's background test and went to an academy and um, the rest is history. And speaking of history, you knew that this question was gonna come up. So how many rescues over the years 
I any, don't know. Any idea? I have. I, I have an idea. All I know is I've been on over two thousand calls, but I don't know the exact number. Um, you know, some of them are mm-hmm. bigger and some of them are smaller. And you know, we we had a call yesterday that you know essentially was we we were called and then it was already handled. And sometimes they go for a week, but um, it, it's it's over a couple thousand, but. The exact number, I don't know. Ask me again in about a week, and I'll know. <laughs> It'll be the end of the year, you know, and, uh, and we'll total things up, you know. Yeah, and all the stats will come out. Yeah, all the stats will come out. But I, I think I've been – because this year, um, maybe it's a benefit of COVID. I don't know. Our <laughs> call volume has not gone down at all. It's gone up because so many people are restricted as to where they can go and what they do. So then they go and um, – recreate and get into trouble and uh mm-hmm. so I've, I've probably been on 70 80 calls this year really? disadvantage and haven't been able to travel for for the cmc as much our our travel was just cut way off for months so yeah i was a, i was around here to go on calls you know well good parts and bad parts right yeah right we don't want to miss misfortune on anybody but you know as a as a volunteer responder you know you'd like to be able to do something once in a while too so well, that's the, way it, that's the way it works, you know? Yeah, I, def, I understand that, you know, coming from the fire service background, you don't really want people to suffer misfortune, but going on structure fires is not a bad thing either. Yeah. Um, but I've seen a lot of changes in that period of time. And and it's funny, you mentioned hardware. And and one of the other big changes that I've seen that circled around so much, and, and you've been through this too, was when we started, as I said, we used um, seven sixteenths inch gold line, and mm-hmm. for our mechanical advantage systems, the ratchet prusik um, and the hall cam, or the whatever you want to call it, but I prefer to call it that. Um, we used um, th- uh, three eighths inch gold line that we short spliced into loops. We didn't tie it. We did, mm-hmm. the, you know, the three thing over, under, over, under, like pioneering merit badge and the Boy Scouts mm-hmm. and made our Prusik loops out of that. And we used those uh, for both ascending the ropes, which was, you know, a, a mandatory skill is was ascending and descending past a knot on rappel. And the other thing was grabbing is as the rope grabs for the for the ratchet and the hall cam. Mm-hmm. And um you know, a lot of our systems probably weren't built as well as they should be, but, um, you know, the Prusiks would drag and they wouldn't grab well and everything like that. And very shortly after, Gibbs came out with the Ascender um, and we started putting those on ropes and it was just like the best thing in the world because here you could pull this pin out, put this device on the rope, it never slipped and you could drag it through the dirt, nothing happened to it or anything like that. And it was a, it was a big evolutionary change. And uh, remember, we were using um, three-strand laid ropes, so there was mm-hmm. none of the issue of sheath de-stripping or she- de-sheathing that we see nowadays or that we hear about and that we do regularly in classes on purpose. And so uh, that was a big thing. But, God, we didn't have to do that short splicing thing anymore and all of that. And <laughs> that was – it was it was funny because the more senior team members um, – just couldn't stand it because um, it was it was too easy or that's not the way they did it or anything. And for years, we still had to ascend ropes using Presex um, instead of ascenders. And we never used handled ascenders because of the die cast. We knew they were too weak for our systems. Mm-hmm. Um, but some people had them that were far more into the climbing than I ever was. But, um, you know, that's one of those things that I think has gone full circle here where we went from a um, – you know, a soft ascender to a hard ascender, back to a soft ascender, and and probably back to a hard ascender again in the near future. Yeah, yeah, and I was gonna. That's kind of where I was, kind of where I was leading. Um, so when you guys switched from gold line to um, Kern Mantle, and you were still using the hardened ascenders, correct? You're still using the Gibbs or whatever. Um, um, yeah, we, we were for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we never had any issues with it. Um, we weren't clever enough to think about it ahead of time or whatever, but, um, we did, when we switched to the half inch Kern mantle, we were still using, um, Gibbs ascenders for a few years. And then, you know, it started coming out that people were having problems, uh, with, 
overstressing the system and desheathing the rope and things like that. But mm-hmm. a, a lot of that is is it's it's uh, not everybody is really open about their mistakes. Some teams have been very open about it, and others haven't. And you know, over the years at CMC, I've heard stories from people about. Um, they've done the same things by accident that we do on purpose in classes, and that is um, bend the side plates, break the eyes on the handle to send or the hard ascenders and various things like that. Mm-hmm. And then people have said, come out with it again. Not everybody's really open about some of their issues, and um, we've seen people come up with these things and say, "Oh yeah, we did that," or "I know somebody that did it," and it's hard to get good documentation on it, but. We never had anything bad happen to us, but we started hearing stories and said, wait a minute here, that's it. And, and of course, mm-hmm. if everything works when everything works, it's, it's always that bad situation where litter gets caught or the litter tender gets his leg stuck in a tree root or whatever it is and can't get to the stop thing there. And probably the thing that saved us more than anything else is our lack of manpower. Um, where we were usually building those kinds of systems was in the backcountry and we wouldn't have the abundance of people that it would take to actually break anything. You know what I mean? It was like everything yeah. we could do to be pulling the load up. And if it got really hard, we were busy asking questions or trying to shed some load on the end of the rope or whatever it is. And uh, had we had an abundance of manpower, we might have had a problem, but we never did. Yeah. So, I mean, short of and it kind of leads into that whole response changes kind of thing as well. Um as opposed to now, you know, on the Crest Highway or something, I'm going to presume that you've got more people than you know what to do with or potentially more people than you know what to do with. Yeah, the, the cars that are on the highway are not really an, an issue because most of those we're handling with the truck. Mm-hmm. And our main haul system with the truck is is a cable winch, mm-hmm. um, you know, PTO driven or hydraulically driven cable winch on the front of the truck. And then the rope is the belay line, and we're pulling that up with a capstan. Mm -hmm. And so all it really takes is one person managing the rope on the capstan, and the engine is doing all the work. And, um, you know, a lot of people are going to go, wait a minute, I took a class from you, and you said don't use mechanical devices like that. And, and, And you're right. We're saying not to do it. The only thing is is that there's been so much history and so many thousands of operations done that way without a problem, but it's a constant worry. It's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of training and we do have pressure reliefs and things like that so that we shouldn't be able to overstress the cable or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, you could still injure a rescuer or anything, but there it's not an issue of overstressing the system because we're not doing it. You know, you know, we're doing it, um, with a machine where we can manage it and not, um, manpower. Now, if we were to have a camp crew in the backwoods when we had to build a system, then then we would have been probably more at risk than we ever were. But uh, many, many times it'd be three of us pulling on the system, and it's everything we can do to pull a, a rescue a, a rescue load and a tender up on the system, and we weren't going to be overstressing it. Yeah. For those that don't know, what is a camp crew? <laughs> <laughs> camp crew, or, camp crew are a bunch of young bucks that are. Um, um, they, they they may be they may be inmates, they may not be, but they're they're young and strong, and they're a fire crew, and they're a great source of labor for clearing a path or or pulling on a system. And um, you know, you you got a lot of you got a lot of horsepower there, if you will, um, immediately. And sometimes it's a little hard to control that many people. Yeah, I think that I think you had said once before, um, you you have to put somebody trained with them, otherwise they'll pull you all the way to the hospital, kind of thing. Yeah, that was kind of the joke, especially if you have um, ad hoc volunteers or what we kind of call a posse comitatus, where you have a motorcycle or somebody that goes over the side, and you're 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 setting a system up, and you've got to grab available, not so much on the side of the road, but somebody slides down the waterfall and you grab all their friends and have them help you pull. And they're very difficult to control because they're going to pull till he gets to the hospital is kind of the joke. And uh, if you're using, you know, convergent volunteers like that for your systems, you really have to manage them. Mm-hmm. The Presic takes care of that. But, um, you know, for those that, that, that aren't, 
aren't convinced, it's easy to de shoot the rope. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Especially that that. Um, well, like you mentioned, we do it in class on purpose, where everybody can kind of see what's going on. It's those. But I refer to them all the time in class as blind races when you can't see what's going on with the load on the other end. You know, and it suddenly gets heavy, and then all of a sudden things go sideways. Well, they say, you know, the going gets tough, the tough gets going, and especially with the people that are doing the pulling, and uh, you've got to manage them, and you've got to have that good communications between your litter tender and your haul system to make sure that that uh, nothing happens to the patient or the litter tender. Yeah, yeah. So um, other gear changes over the years? Well, um those were the biggies. I mean, carabiners are carabiners. We use nothing but locking carabiners, of course. We use all aluminum, um, but really those haven't haven't changed that much. I mentioned earlier going from the the brake bars into those oval carabiners um, to the figure eights of various evolutions of the figure eights. Um, we never were really. Uh, on an individual basis, we're, we're not using brake bar racks. So we don't really have a caver background where uh, mm -hmm. we had really long swinging repels. Um, you know, we've just about always got our, unless it's training or we're going off a bridge or something, we pretty much always have our feet on a surface and we're not as worried about that. But we've, we've used brake bar racks um, for lowering systems. Um, again, we usually are coming up but not always, but, um, you know, as a, as a system, as more, as opposed to personal gear, we use brake bar racks, mm -hmm. um, at the time now, now it's, it's gone. Those have gone away pretty much, but, um, thinking, thinking about other hardware devices and things like that, the, the harness has evolved, uh, from, from really nothing. Um, we were tying harnesses at a three eighths inch gold line. Uh, for a long time, which was just a seat harness, uh, that kind of migrated to webbing. Um, we had some first sewn harnesses, of which I still have one, that were totally minimal. Um, probably most like uh, the most basic fall protection harness with no padding, um, one 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 connection at the waist. Um, we had we had shoulder straps. They were full body harnesses because that was the requirement in this county for a long, long time. That they had to be a full body harness, but um, there were no padding, there were no additional connection points, there weren't any places to collect your gear or anything like that. They were extremely uncomfortable, but again, we use it for you know maybe a quick rappel and a sand, and most of the time we weren't really wearing a harness that much. But the advantage to the full body harnesses for the litter tenders were that many of us would just take the waist attachment point and put it around the top pipe rail of the litter. Mm -hmm. And then the shoulder harness, uh, you know, was hands-free then, you know, your legs were holding up the load and uh, the harness was not going to come down because it had shoulder straps on it. So it was, it was kind of, it's difficult to start and end the transition, but um, while you're going up the side of the embankment, it's a much easier way to go. So um, big changes on the harness front as far as that goes. And of course, those harnesses, we had them sewn by a guy that made harnesses for people that did hang gliding, and there was no consideration of ASTM standards or NFPA standards or anything. You know, it's like, hey, if a hang glider guy hangs in it, they must be okay. But um, <laughs> there's been just such an evolution in this industry as far as the standards for the equipment and training that didn't exist 40 years ago. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, speaking of standards, um, you know, obviously you will, I don't know, obviously, but I mean, it's obvious to me, but um, you do sit on some of the standards committees um, along with obviously several other people, um, some end users, some manufacturers, um, subject matter experts, that type of thing. Um, the promulgation of the standards, what do you anticipate as far as the new standards coming out as well as potential upcoming changes? Are you hearing anything along those lines? Well, we just finished the cycle for NFPA 1670 and 1983, and there aren't a lot of major changes there. 
Um, there's some procedural things within FPA that have been changing in the last few years. And uh, those two standards, along with um, 1858, are combined into a new standard that's going to be called 2500. But they're, the individual standards are developed by different committees. But again, there's there, there are changes. There's always... There's always changes to languages and um, things you learn once you write the standard and having been involved with that for 30 some odd years, um, you think you thought of it all and somebody else comes up with something else and it's maybe a good idea and maybe not a good idea, but you still got to consider it. And many, many times um, you, you the standard is written by a group of people that certainly have a lot of experience and knowledge, but um, it, it just doesn't come out right. You know, you think it's going to work or you think it's a certain way. And um, that's the reason why standards have that five-year revision cycle, because you find things that that either change, you know, in, 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 in the standards testing or in the standards writing that need to be uh, um, just revised and refreshed and correct it or whatever you want to do. Nobody's perfect. And um, that's something that's always going on within the standards committees as far as what new are they going to look at or anything. I don't know. But, um, you know, it's it's an ongoing process and it takes a lot of people. And that's one of the things that um, I'm kind of seeing as somebody that may be winding down a little bit on this is that there isn't a lot of new interest in it. Quite honestly, it takes a certain mindset to be in standards geek, and I'm not going to claim to be one. I've just done it a long time, but um, I wish that there were more new people or younger people or fresh faces or however you want to phrase it that would get into this into the standards process because, um, one, it's going to create better standards for everybody, and we need to keep it going. The standards have to be, again, mandatory revision cycles and um, new ways to look at things. And we just need some 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 new faces in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, so uh, looking at the list, the last time, I think when the uh, 1983, the last time 1983, and if you compare the previous editions, there are a lot of common... There, there's a lot of common names, obviously, um, between the, the versions. But some of us are, uh, like you mentioned, we're not exactly the youngest out there anymore <laughs> either. <laughs> um, so you guys have uh, an advantage or tools that you use, namely helicopters, that a lot of places in the country, including here in the Midwest, um, we just don't have that, um, that resource, mm -hmm. it, at least not on the same scale by any means. Um, how does that interface with your typical response? Well, or yeah, a I typical mean, response, I should say. It, it's just an expectation of a helicopter in Los Angeles County. You have, um, Los Angeles County Sheriff's, Los Angeles County Fire, Los Angeles City, big public safety agencies that have big air forces, and other counties in Southern California, especially maybe not the same quantity, but San Bernardino, Riverside, San Diego, Ventura, Orange, all have helicopter programs and um, may not have the medium lift helicopter capability that we have here, but um, and some of them do, San Bernardino does, for instance. But um, it's just almost an expectation, and that's just a matter of population. You know, I mean, the population of Los Angeles County, you know, is you know we've got ten thousand people here, or ten. Excuse me, I wish ten, <laughs> ten, ten. Sorry, ten. You got you got this population base of ten million people, and when you you consider the adjacent counties, uh, the whole metro area here, depending on traffic, of course, within an hour or two hours. Um, you can, you can, you can go, I mean, in Los Angeles County, you've got underwater to 10,000 foot peaks and in, in a good traffic day in an hour. And, um, so you have this wide range of places where people can go and you have a lot of population and you have, um, you've got, consequently you have big resources, whereas, um, in, in less populated areas of the state, um, and certainly in less populated areas of the country, you don't have that. But 
the joke that I make around here, and this has nothing to do with with wildland rescue or anything like that, is the people in this town, they dial 911 and they expect to put the phone down and hear a siren. And Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, that's obviously, you know, an EMS call in town or something like that. But that's kind of their expectation. And when the weather is bad or the fires are burning and the helicopters are tied up and everything, people somehow think that they there's this expectation that they're going to do that and that they're going to get this instant response. And it doesn't always work that way, which, um, you know, might be a disappointment for them. But, um, but it all boils down to we're kind of spoiled um, where we, we um, it's, it's great for the, for the victims, if you will. But um, it's also great for us because we're used to it's like it's going to get handled quickly or we're going to get transportation and we're not going to have to walk for five hours and we're not going to have to carry a victim out a long ways. You know, it's like, yeah, we might have to hump them up the side of the hill to get them to a place where we can we can get them with a hook in the cable. But, um, it, you know, we're 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 blessed, spoiled or however you want to say it uh, by that that isn't everywhere else. So. I just have to keep that in mind and when I talk to other mountain rescue teams around the state and the country that I know that that we have that. And and there's certainly other places in the country that have those kinds of resources and certainly those kinds of resources are in other resort areas in the world, you know, in mm-hmm. France and things like that. That's that's the kind of service you're gonna get probably too. How you pay for it's a little different, but that's another story. <laughs> You know, we, I mean, it's so bad here that there, we had a, a raft of calls um, and, and the, the eight minute call that I mentioned from yesterday might have even been one of those um, where uh, local kids were going and saying, uh, you know, putting it out to their friends, um, you know, go up, go up here and call for help. You'll get a helicopter ride. And after uh, it happened to primarily providing the way the cell phones were going, it was going to LA city. And finally they were like, Hey, knock it off. We're going to get up there. You're okay. Throw them a bottle of water and tell them to walk home. And then the word got out. You weren't getting a helicopter ride anymore, but um, that's kind of an expectation sometimes. And, you know, it's a little off a rope rescue subject, but it's yeah, just it, the way it, it is, works. But it, yeah, it is, but it isn't. I mean, I, just looking at the population density, LA County is double that of the state that I live in. So, and I'm not saying you know. it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I do kind of prefer, you know, 10 minutes from my house being in the, the uh, state forest and, um, you know, not seeing another soul. But then again, I really don't like people all that much. So that they, well, they see, kind 10 of minutes from, 10 minutes from my house, I can be in the national forest. The difference is, is I'm going to see a whole lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. True. Um. So where do you think, where do you anticipate or where do you think things are going? I I know you and I have talked about it before. Equipment wise, um, it's kind of like what's old is new again. Um, Yeah, definitely. Definitely things are going lighter. I think um, equipment's not breaking. The standards have done their job. People misuse equipment that like we've talked about um, already but um the equipment is not breaking the rope's not breaking and things like that and this the standards especially the equipment standards well pretty much all standards come from bad things happening and Mm. it could be from as simple as the national electric code you know nfpa 70 came from um you know obviously buildings were starting on fire because insulation was inadequate and people were getting zapped because uh, the coverings weren't adequate on the circuit breaker panel or whatever, you know, I'm, mm-hmm. but um, it, standards all come from that to try and keep people alive. And that's all good. And um, it, the, the origins for 1983, the, the, the rope and equipment standard came from ropes breaking because of people were using natural fiber ropes. They were decaying and losing their strength and people were dying. And that was a bad thing. And then it's evolved to these other things. But people, you know, you can still cut a rope. I'm not saying that at all, but it's not snapping because of the load of a second rescuer on it like happened in the past. And so now it's kind of like now that we have these standards, how can we make the equipment meet the standards still? Or can we even, and I never thought I'd see it, but some of the standards have actually relaxed a little bit 
on the strength. Mm-hmm. You know, the last time the the T rating on the carabiners, for instance, went went uh, went to a lower value, and so I think people are saying, "Wait a minute, okay, we 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 overbuilt, and now we're going to go back a little bit, and it's still going to be more than adequate, but it's not going to be quite as heavy and maybe not quite as expensive or quite as complicated or something like that." I think. I think they're finding a little more equilibrium there as as equipment uh, gets developed. Obviously, there's going to be new materials. You know, I don't know if there's ever going to be plastic carabiners, but um, certainly things. You know, this steel to aluminum. Look at look at the number of people that still insist that they need to use steel, mm-hmm. um, and and then you know, obviously titanium. Some devices are made out of that. There's certainly a cost. If if lightweight is is to your advantage, and if all of your calls are based um, a couple hundred feet from your apparatus, um, there's no problem with steel. No doubt about the fact that it's strong, it's less expensive, and things like that. But you know, where we're going to either put it on our harnesses and hump it in, or fly in with it, or something like that, then the weight starts to be an issue. And you can see that. Um, <laughs> You know, we're blessed. We have titanium litters. And when I go pick up a stainless steel litter, it's like, you know, it's twice as heavy and you really notice it. Well, now you're carrying that into the field. Um, that makes a lot of difference. And, of course, it's a big piece of equipment and it certainly has an expense. But, um, you know, there's titanium litters on helicopters because it's gas every day, you know, and things like that. And it's the right. same thing with people in the field. and. You know, for for the career fire service, um, you know, you're you're going to have the manpower, but for volunteer agencies, fire service, other public safety, search and rescue volunteers, it's harder and harder to get volunteers. Um, mm-hmm. Just the way their work schedules and all those sorts of things that are evolving, um, you don't have as many people to carry the equipment in. You don't have as many people to pull, or whatever it is. So I think there's going to be more labor saving devices, and uh, you know. Pretty soon, you know, they, they may be, we may be back to uh, small, small winches, you know, using rechargeable batteries and things like that. Where one time we had one in the field that worked off a chainsaw engine. It was louder than heck, but obviously there's battery powered ones that are, that are very effective and you don't see a lot of them, but, you know, I can see some things like that that are going to save labor um, mm-hmm. being used out there. Yeah, well, and I, and I totally agree, um, especially when you look at, I mean, I just look at staffing numbers, you know, even with career departments, you know, budget challenges, those kind of things where, you know, they don't have the staffing that they did even 10 years ago that um, a lot of the career organizations, at least around here, um, are starting to see that that those implications of those budget challenges where there may be positions that are open that you're just not going to fill or can't fill. Well, and then it's, it's, it's really a little out of my wheelhouse, but I do read all the trade press and that's the issue with this, with, with standards again, again, the, the mm-hmm. staffing standards and things like that. That's something that's your background as a chief, as opposed to mine as, as just a, an onlooker. But, um, you know, I think that, and, and, it, and it may be a result of COVID or whatever, but uh, people are looking at it and going, do we really need to have this staffing standard or something like that? I think for safety, they probably do. Again, I'm, I'm not an expert on any of that, but that it's going to have an effect on us. Mm-hmm. And um, that, that turns around and translates into equipment, meaning you don't need as much, but it has to do more because there's fewer people to do the job. Yeah, and that's I guess that's kind of where I was leading toward um... – so I, I don't know, give me your opinion of this. Is it, when I look at the descent control numbers and then we look at the T-rated hardware numbers like you had mentioned, especially with like carabiners, um, and you look at the descent control numbers, both dropped off relatively dramatically. Um, if, do you think it's because people are actually doing math and getting smarter or... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because let's face it, I know we were all told there would be no math, but um, I mean, do you think that's part of it, that there's maybe a better understanding of what's really going on? You know, somebody's standing there taking a look at it and going, you know what, I really don't think we need to have this stuff that's ridiculous strong. 
we can get by with knocking a third off of the strength, for instance. Well, I, I think it is. And this is um, something like with the, the Technical Rescue Symposium, that's the kind of thing where those are the – those are the cutting edge or the leading, the thought leaders of this thing where people come in and look at that and they present it and it, and it takes a long time. To, some of this stuff is nah, not so great, mm -hmm. but there are some things like that where people come out with it and probably things that we saw at the Technical Rescue Symposium 20 and 30 years ago are now a commonplace, whereas people were looking at it going, that's craziness. And I really think that's it. I mean, I certainly wasn't there, but the, the, that's the story that I got from people that were there in the beginning of, of 1983, and the first standard was on rope. And again, it came because natural fiber ropes were breaking. So, of course, they said no natural fibers. But, you know, it's like, how strong does that rope have to be? And some people were going, well, let's make it, you know, they chose a load and, mm -hmm. and said, well, let's make it 10 times. And somebody else goes, you know, if 10 is good, 15 is better. And they go, okay, we'll make it 15. And, of course, that never appears anywhere in there. I know people can do the math, and we don't want to get into this argument about <laughs> 10 times safety factor or 15 times or anything like that because that's a whole other topic. But, right. um, you know, assuming that story is true, they basically pulled the number out of the air. And we do know that when that number came out, which was that 9,000-pound number because it mm -hmm. was in pounds in those days um, – Nobody met it, and eventually the rope manufacturers engineered the rope to meet the standard, and um, you know, and the, and the rest is history on that. But going back to that, if ten is good, fifteen is better kind of attitude, I think that's where a lot of the numbers came from. And now that we have um, so much history on it, we've got people that are interested and they're doing the testing, people that are far smarter than me that sit around and think about it, and then they. They go, you know, do we really need to do this? And that's why I think these numbers got revised. And again, that's a good thing. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. again, a reason why the standards – and that's a reason why the standards have balance. You know, there's kind of a misconception. We've heard other podcasts about this where the committees are all manufacturers and, and the committees yeah. aren't. You'd be at NFPA or ASTM or whatever, the committees have balance, which means there's more end users than there are manufacturers. And – um you know, if, you, if, if for the people that feel that way, get some support and go. I mean, it's they're not very exciting, and especially this year with all the <laughs> meetings being on Zoom or anything, they go faster. I got to give them that, um, and they're certainly less expensive than traveling some far off point to, to to go to a meeting. But I don't. I think you miss a lot of uh, the the one on one interactions and things like that that go on. But mm -hmm. um, for those of the people that don't like the standards and think that they're rigged somehow participate in the process and shut up because um, we need people to do that. I, I made that pitch already and I'll do it again is we need new people to come in there and look at it. But I, we don't need people that are saying things like that, that aren't true, that don't really know how it works. And um, <laughs> to answer your question. Yeah. I think people are just thinking about it more. They've got a bigger ability. Heck in the old days, you know, you had a dynamometer that, you know, weighed 10 pounds or whatever and wasn't very accurate and it pushed a little needle around to see what your peak was where now you can get, you know, all kinds of electronics that can measure all kinds of places at the same time that are much more, have much higher resolution or are far more accurate. And mm -hmm. um, so people are taking advantage of that and they're able to do backyard testing and ask those what if questions. And eventually yeah, it cycles up to, the equipment manufacturers and the, and the equipment standards. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. I think that, you know, overall just education and history, being able to take a look back on a lot of, I mean, now we're looking at, you know, 35, 40 years of, of the standard being essentially being out there, you know, the equipment standards being out there and actually seeing what's going on in the field. Um, I think that does have a big, a big uh, influence overall. Um, but like you said, it does take time for it to cycle up to the manufacturers of the of the different gear. You know, plus we don't have to do math with a slide rule anymore, which is uh, well, always yeah, a plus. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, sure. And 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 then the other thing that happened with the standards on that is is that they they evolved into the 
not one size fits all anymore. You know, if you look mm-hmm. at the equipment standard, you've got the G rating, you've got the T rating, you've got the escape rating, and that's um, you know makes a resolution where the G rating is you know, is is certainly the most robust, but at the same time, the idea was is that it was harder for the people that didn't have as much skill or training um, to screw up and get hurt. Mm-hmm. And the whole point of the standards is keep people from getting hurt or worse. So, right. um, you know, they they have evolved that way too, uh, where you can say we're doing this and this is why we're doing it, and it's uh, you know, like I say, less one size fits all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because obviously what works for you or even what worked for you, um, you know, backcountry wise 30 years ago wouldn't have worked for us in where I worked. No. Um, it, 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 it's like, uh, you know, apples and oranges, you know, they're similar. Yeah, there's rope and that's about where the commonality ended. Mm-hmm. Um, so what did any insight um on um anything you would change over the years <laughs> we don't like change uh no. <laughs> well, we don't like the way things are either so yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> got to get that one in right <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah i don't i don't know that's a hard thing to say what would you change no, i don't know would it, i mean Tech, techniques wise, I think we're we're kind of coming back to full circle again. Um, kind of like the gear thing, like we had talked about before. You know, going from seven sixteenths or eleven millimeter to twelve point five. Now we're yeah, that's 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 easier to pin down. But but the technique thing it varies so much because, um, y- you know, the way a, a caver does it versus the way a climber does it versus the way a uh, public safety rescue does it. They're mm-hmm. all using rope. They're all using carabiners. They're all using similar hardware, but because the environment is so so different as far as anchors or other conditions and things that you know the kind of rock, you know the surfaces they're on, um, it, it's, it's it's kind of hard to make a big generalization. There's so many different ways to use this equipment, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, low angle versus high angle and, and everything. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of tough to say because the audience is so wide. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, even, even if you look at the, at the instructors in the school, um, in the rescue school, just backgrounds are so wildly different from, mm-hmm. you know, essentially wildland slash mountain backcountry to urban only. Um, you know, definitely just the, the background and experience is hugely different. Well, and, and, and even within one of those groups, you know, when you have somebody that's um, not necessarily the school staff, but if you have um, responders that are come from, say, volunteer fire agencies, that so we don't have any, but if there were, um, the way they're going to treat it is different than somebody that's in a, a, a larger, more, well, probably better funded municipal department and everything like that. And we see that so much in 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 wildland rescue um you know even as even in the state of california mountain rescue association california region here we have well except for this year we have the uh an annual you know recertification where all teams get together and we go through a a standard series of tests for the team and in one of the three mountain rescue areas of either um you know search management searching and tracking or technical rock or snow and ice but um there's such a wide variation in climatic zones in the state that, um, you know, the kind of anchors that, that we tie on to in Southern California, where it's basically uh, chemise forest or um, not real trees and everything like that, are, are very different than people that are in, you know, higher country environment or anything like that. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, when they haven't burned them down around here, I mean, you know, we get something two or three inches in diameter in a lot of cases we're really happy for an anchor where there's a lot of people from, um, you know, say the Pacific Northwest would never even, you know, what are you doing kind of thing. And, um, so it's, you, you know, you have, you have to know your area and, and that's going to make a difference on how you, you respond and what kind of anchors you use. And even between a pure climber on hard rock environment, like, 
like Yosemite, the kind of things they do and the kind of anchors they use is going to be way different than that we're going to do where we don't really have a lot of hard rock climbing. It's mostly, um, you know, decomposing granite and, and mm -hmm. non-technical people that you're rescuing, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, a rescue to, to do something on on El Cap or Half Tome or someplace like that at Yosemite where you've got a climber that that may be more skilled than you are um, versus the kind of people that we have, you know, mm -hmm. that you're lucky if they have shoes on sometimes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And they're not going there. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was going to be the other part, but <laughs> yeah, or or maybe they're that way, you know, as a combination thereof. Um, so any, I I guess we're kind of coming back to that that full circle thing again. But um, any any other thoughts as far as um, where you've been seen done over the last forty seven ish? years versus um, kind of where they're headed or where you well, anticipate they're Well, I mean, it, thing, things are keep getting better. The, the equipment's continually improving. There's new devices being, being, in, being invented and other older devices being improved upon. Um, you know, some of the techniques have stayed exactly the same. I mean, a three to one's a three to one. It's just the rope and all the hardware that you use to build the three to one that's changed. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's going to be that way as, as far as any of our skills. I mean, certainly medical skills or anything else are going the same way. Um, the biggest thing is for people to, to, to keep up on their training and practice with the equipment so that they know how to do it when they have it in an emergency. And then as a, as a, as a volunteer and the standards process and as a, as a volunteer responder is, uh, finding new people that are willing to put in the time because it's not easy and it certainly doesn't pay very well as a volunteer. But um, that's something that I see as the biggest problem right now, not just looking in the mirror, but looking around is, is uh, getting people to replace people. And this doesn't, it's not just for a volunteer mountain rescue responder, but it's the same way the volunteer fire service, uh, just the demographics and, and the way the world is changing is finding people to do these jobs uh, that are essential. They need to be done. Um, you know, people. We're keeping people from dying, and um, that needs to happen. And uh, the biggest deal is get getting people in that are willing to do it. Yeah, yeah. And if physically you can't do it anymore, then you know, get involved in something else like the standards or something that takes um, less physical ability and maybe a different kind of uh, mental ability. You got to yeah. be crazy for all of it, but you know, well, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a varying levels of crazy. That's all there is to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have one final question for you. USC, yes. USC or UCLA. Um, for me personally or what? Yeah. For you personally. Uh, Matt I, and I were talking about this the I other day, and I, I said, I can't remember. I, I didn't. I, I have attended a couple of classes at SC, but I live with somebody that graduated from UCLA, so <laughs> I have to go to UCLA. <laughs> I have more of my family that was UC people than other than SC people. Okay. But I'm a minority in my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I anticipated that, yes. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that's where I'm just going to leave it right there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, John. All right.